Delaware Street. <laughs> and I said, wow, you really are the person who wrote the letter to Thurgood Marshall, I mean to, uh, uh, to the senator about Thurgood Marshall. She said, well, my daddy had bought me a manual typewriter that previous Christmas, and I was in college, and the dean told me not to write the letter, but I wanted to write it, and I did. And she said, uh, so tell me something else about that movie, The Butler. <laughs> so I'm going to read you the three real short snippets from the book. Um, um, this first one is um, on the day <clears throat> that Lyndon Johnson summoned some people to the White House. It was a secret nomination. He didn't tell the nation until the moment it happened, and he didn't tell other U.S. senators he wanted to surprise them. He didn't want anybody to get up ahead of steam to stop Marshall. So this is a scene that takes place inside the White House, and uh, Louis Martin is there. He was a White House aide. Uh, uh, he was a black man. Uh, and President Johnson and Thurgood Marshall and a couple other aides. <laughs> On the morning of June 13, 1967, Lyndon B. Johnson gathered some key members of his staff in the Oval Office. Among them were the aides, Marvin Watson and Clifford Alexander. There was also Thurgood Marshall, who had been a federal appeals court judge, and Louis Martin, a White House advisor, Martin, a Negro, was also a high-ranking member of, of the Democratic National Committee. He had known Thurgood Marshall for years and looked upon him with an enormous amount of reverence. A Negro butler served light refreshments to the small gathering. There was a feeling around the room of heightened emotion mixed with swooning, especially by all of the black people present, who were present. Lyndon Johnson was going to nominate a Negro to the U.S. Supreme Court. He told no one save a very few close aides because he was not going to be talked out of it. I want to do this job that Abraham Lincoln started, he said to his aides about the plans. Thurgood Marshall had been considered public enemy number one throughout the South because of his court victories upending many of the laws of segregation. With Johnson's nomination of Marshall, it was as if the president were hammering the final nail into the coffin of white supremacy. Thurgood, LBJ said to Marshall, I'm nominating you because you're a lot like me, much bigger than life, and we come from the same kind of people. There had never been a president with the kind of bees around Negroes that Lyndon Johnson had. Johnson knew how much it meant to Louis Martin to be in the White House on this day. Johnson finally rose from the sofa after ordering Marshall to phone his wife, Sissy, and inform her of what was about to happen. Johnson began to lead the group outside. Louis Martin was an emotional sort. He had desperately wanted to get a job on a major newspaper after taking a journalism degree in 1934, but major newspapers were not hiring Negroes. He wound up in Cuba, writing freelance articles before returning to America and editing a small Negro newspaper. Whenever he'd run into Marshall, airports, train stations, Chicago or Harlem bar rooms, they'd get to reminiscing about all the things they'd seen, Negro chain gangs, segregated movie theaters, all white police departments, they get to recalling those restaurants that made them go around the back just to get a sandwich. Now this, a Supreme Court nomination. Louis Martin was so sentimental that he would often cry when there was some kind of exalted Negro achievement to celebrate big tears just welling up 
in his eyes. As President Johnson began to speak alongside Thurgood Marshall, Louis Martin began sobbing for two reasons. The first was sheer joy in how happy he was for Thurgood Marshall. The second reason was worry and fear. He knew how difficult the looming battle for confirmation was going to be. When Johnson and Marshall finally emerged from the White House, <laughs> walking toward the Rose Garden in the bank of microphones, members of the press suddenly looked up. Some squinted to see more clearly against the glare of sunlight as the hum of whispering started. When Marshall himself was unmistakably spotted just over the president's left shoulder, the air filled with heightened curiosity. Reporters started jockeying for better positions. Photographers raised their cameras. There was a feeling that something profound was about to happen. This is later, after the, uh, the five days actually was stretched over 14 days. So Marshall uh, thought it was going to be like Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then the following Monday. But he would get a call at home from one of the, from, from one of the aides to one of the powerful Southern segregationist senators, and they would say, uh, Mr. Marshall, the hearings tomorrow have been canceled. We found something about you that we don't like. And it would put fear in the third grade marshal. He didn't know what was going on. And he would call the White House. And they didn't know what was going on either because these Southern senators were very powerful. And um, Eastland, who was the chairman, uh, uh, could willing to snap his fingers and he could say, uh, the hearings tomorrow are going to be canceled. They're good. Uh, I'm actually meeting with three FBI agents about you and something that you did back in 1947. Marshall would have no idea what they were talking about. Lyndon Johnson was so fearful that uh, he devised another plan. Uh, he went and secretly recruited William Coleman, who was also black, and told William Coleman, he said, look, if I can't get Marshall confirmed, then I'm coming after you, because I'm going to integrate this court. Uh, that's how hell-bent he was. Uh, but <clears throat> here we are. The hearings are over with, and uh, Senator Eastland uh, would not call the floor vote for the full Senate. Uh, he would not release the findings uh, until six weeks had passed. So. You can imagine having to wait six weeks to find out if you'll even get a vote. And so after six weeks, uh, some of the northern senators, Phil Hart of Michigan, uh, it was Ted Kennedy of Massachusetts, Robert Kennedy of New York, Everett Dirksen, uh, he was a Republican out of Illinois, very powerful, very smart man, loved Thurgood Marshall. Uh, they all went to work uh, to get Marshall confirmed, and this is this is sort of the scene. I mean, well, this is this is the scene uh, that took place. White House aides had been tabulating numbers in the days leading up to the final vote. While a Supreme Court nominee requires 50 votes to pass. The important number for the White House was 60 votes. The number needed to avoid a filibuster. Told in the days leading up to the vote that they had 50 votes, enough for Marshall's confirmation, Johnson was focused on the 60 votes needed to stop a filibuster. If the Southerners managed to get 60 votes, they could filibuster the nomination to death and LBJ knew it. With the turmoil in the streets, he simply could not afford any filibuster. And that is what he told those senators on the other end of his phone calls. Strategically, he courted, he courted Southern senators who listened to him 
when he urged them to not vote. Because if they did not vote, their votes would not show up in the figures to be released to the public. The White House counted a tally of 6931, only nine votes beyond a filibuster. And the no vote count of 31 was not a figure Johnson wanted to present to the country, which is why he kept hammering Southern senators to not vote. After six hours, it was finally agreed that there would be no more delays. The time had come to vote. Senator Mike Mansfield opened the voting, and soon there were the echoes throughout the chamber. Aiken, yay! Anderson, yay! Byrd, nay! Eastland, nay! Hill, nay! Sparkman, nay! Church, yay! Lausche, yay! Hell, yay! Percy, yay! Thurman, nay! Some of the votes were uttered in even monotones, while others soared high in volume, causing necks to crane throughout the galleries. Kennedy, yay! Long, nay! When it was all over, Final tally showed 69-31. LBJ and his White House aides had prevailed to make a vote that could have been 69-31 actually turn into 